Let us pray for inspiration. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our hearts and kindle in them the fire of your love. Amen. <clears throat> There's a scene in the Gospel of Matthew that makes me very uncomfortable. It seems to cast Jesus in a bad light. And I feel reluctant to use it in church. I didn't even put it in the bulletin today, this scene. <laughs> But I've learned that scenes in the Bible that make me uncomfortable are often challenging me and challenging us as people of faith. And this scene in chapter 15 of Matthew's Gospel that I'm thinking of, I think it can tell us something very crucial about what it means to follow in the way of Jesus in our world today in the midst of certain turmoil in our world. In this scene, Jesus and his disciples are traveling in the very northwest part of Palestine. And if you look in the inside of your back cover, there's a picture, a map. And you can follow that map up to the northwest corner I think you can see Tyre or Sidon up there. It's Tyre and Sidon are up. It's above north of Nazareth where Jesus grew up, and they were traveling there. And while they were traveling there, a woman from this region known as a Canaanite, Canaanites lived there, approached Jesus. And this is what happened. Watch. Lord, son of David, my daughter is tormented by a demon. I was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Lord, help me. Help me, please. It's not fair. It's not fair to take the food of the children and throw it to the dogs. Yes, Lord. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall on the floor from thy master's table. My good woman, great is your faith. Let it be done to you as you wish. Your daughter is healed. I don't know about you, but I am really relieved <laughs> when Jesus finally offers kindness and mercy to this poor woman. But what explains his initial harshness? Well, it's mostly because of what seems to separate Jesus from this woman. Jesus' people are Israelites. And they have allegiance to the one true God of goodness who created the whole universe, who created all reality to radiate that goodness. But other people in the land, Palestine, like the Canaanites, have allegiance to gods like Baal, whom they feel they can manipulate through their rituals and sacrifices to do their bidding take care of their will. They want to control God. Not just other peoples of the lands, but the empires around the land do the same thing. Have allegiance to Baal. Want to manipulate God. And the great prophets of Israel warn the people over and over and over and over not to be seduced by the ways of people who want to manipulate God for their own purposes. They go as far as to say, don't even associate with those who could contaminate you this way. And I think that explains Jesus' initial harshness. 
But Jesus has a change of heart in this scene that can be explained, I think, by what he must come to see that he has in common with this woman in front of him. Their land. Palestine. They both live in Palestine, occupied by the Roman Empire. Occupied land, both of them. And this empire exercises its might through military power. And it controls people by making them go through checkpoints. Especially around the Roman settlements in Palestine. Jesus and this Canaanite woman both know that Palestine has always been occupied by empires. There was the Assyrian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, and then the Roman Empire. And they both know that the essential tool of empire is military might supported by oppressive taxation, concentrating wealth in the hands of the few, exploiting labor of those who are occupied. And they both know that essential strategies of empire are intimidation, intimidating people into obeying and separating people to keep them weak and demoralized and dependent on empire. They both know this so well, Jesus and this woman. And they both know the profound indignity and demoralization of living as occupied people. They're both Palestinians. And Jesus... His whole mission has been to seek out such people who are demoralized, powerless, hopeless, to seek them out and to bring them the message of the kingdom of God as a response to the empire of man. This kingdom of God holds every single individual as having dignity and worth and beauty and promise. The kingdom of God never divides people. The kingdom of God unites people in God's ways of compassion and service and community and forgiveness and justice and mercy. Mercy. And when this Canaanite woman cries out to Jesus, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. She's using the key word of the kingdom, mercy. And she knows that Jesus knows that. And she is saying that I recognize that you are a messenger of this kingdom and not the empire of man. You have come, I'm saying, when I call you son of David, Messiah, I recognize that you have come to liberate people like me from the values of empire. You've come not to separate people, but to bring people together in God's kingdom. People like me who are demoralized and weak and powerless recognize that. And Jesus' eyes are open by this woman's faith in him and the kingdom that he proclaims. And the healing of this woman's daughter is a sign of the power of that kind of faith. So how does this scene speak to us today? 
as followers of the way of Jesus? Well, first it sheds light on today's occupation of Palestine by the state of Israel. People of the land, people whose families have been there for generations and generations and generations and generations, Palestinian Christians, Palestinian Muslims, Palestinian non-religious people live under occupation. In Gaza, on your map, you can see that little area, the south. It's about as big as Modesto. In Gaza, the people are walled off and kept from commerce and trade through blockades around Gaza. It's a military occupation. And we know in this recent war that 1,800 people in Gaza were killed by bombing. Many, many women and children. We've seen them on television, these images, like shooting fish in a barrel, no place to go. And in the West Bank, and you see that on the map, people are subject to checkpoints. Every day makes their normal journey to work or school oppressive, getting there. And they are walled off from Israeli settlements, which the world has declared illegal settlements, and settlements that take control of vital resources like water. And these ways of occupation have been condemned by the United Nations, by religious leaders, including Jewish leaders, by our own denomination, the United Church of Christ, which has always had a position of two states. It's important to realize that the people, the Israelites of Jesus' day, are not the same political reality as the state of Israel today. The Israelites of Jesus' day, whom he calls the house of Israel in today's gospel scene. Remember, he says, I've come to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. These people are living under occupation, the force of occupation, and the state of Israel is such a force. And as followers of the way of Jesus, we must always speak out against the ways of empire wherever we find them whether we find them in Israel, whether we find them in our own country, we have been guilty of the ways of occupation. We also have to speak out against supporting the ways of occupation, which our country has done in Israel. And of course, we must speak out against the violence of Hamas. All these forms of violence and control they might bring a Pax Romana, the kind of peace that existed in the Roman Empire, a forced peace, a peace of intimidation, a peace where people dare not move, but not true peace. But even more basic for us is to understand that the way of Jesus is a way of resisting the values of empire in our everyday life. For example, the accumulation of money and possessions is a primary value of empire to shore itself up, to be secure, privileged, powerful. And that's why Jesus says, don't store up riches. That's why Jesus says, wherever your heart is, that's where your treasure is. That's why Jesus says, you can't serve both God and money. And so, the way of Jesus is to resist the temptation of greed or fear that keeps us holding on to things for security. The way of Jesus 
means to live more simply. It means to share more what we have. Different way of life. Another value of empire is entitlement. Believing that I am entitled to certain privileges. I am entitled to consume just as much as I want whenever I want. I am entitled not to be inconvenienced. That's the worst thing for us. (laughs) Not to be inconvenienced on the road or in the market or at church (laughs) or by a panhandler disturbing us. Being entitled means believing that I not only have the right, but the duty to express every opinion that comes to my mind (laughs) and to make sure people snap when I express that opinion. That's entitlement. The way of Jesus means resisting that sense of entitlement. That's why Jesus said, whoever wants to be first of all, be last of all. Be the servant of all. And then, you know what? You'll discover dignity. You'll know your true worth, and you'll know the worth of other people. It's the same worth. Another value of empire is domination, controlling others. Controlling others. How do we do that? I think we do it all day long. (laughs) We do it all day to try to make things go our way in conversations, in subtle ways sometimes, to manipulate, etc. So in conversations, we should practice listening without an agenda. No agenda. (laughs) In serving, we should serve everything without ulterior motives. Be served in return, get noticed, get rewarded, feel superior, and and we should show mercy the way that Jesus showed mercy to this woman who approaches him. You know what the works of mercy are? Hmm. Feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, caring for the sick, visiting the prisoner, Jesus lists a lot of works of mercy in chapter 25 of Matthew's gospel. Mercy, that's the opposite of domination. Not coming from a point of view of being patronizing, but realizing that we are brothers and sisters. So what do we look like when we're transformed by this This way of resistance of Jesus. What do we look like? Well, I think we look like the Canaanite woman in today's scene. She's beautiful. Where is she? (laughs) Beautiful. She's beautiful in her humility. Radiant in her dignity. Bold in her courage on behalf of her daughter. All because she has faith in Jesus, and in the kingdom that he proclaims. And Jesus invites us to the very same kind of faith, the very same kind of beauty and dignity and hope and purpose, community, for our sake and for the sake of everyone in the world longing for liberation from the values of oppression. So how does that sound to you? Liberation in order to discover dignity and beauty and radiance, to know our profound connection, peace that comes from letting go of domination and control, a much profounder peace and true peace. If that way of Jesus sounds good to you and that dream of God for the world sounds good for you, to you, please say amen. amen. This song that we're going to sing, 
comes from our, uh, our own UCC hymnal. And I think it expresses some of the complexity of how we serve people and our own privilege or entitlement. It reflects on that. So let's sing. Now we share our prayers of joy and concern. And as always, I ask you to keep the information part to a minimum, but to say what it is that you want to ask God for or thank God for. And after each prayer, we'll sing what we've been singing in response. Hear our prayer, O God. And I'll start by collecting your prayers in the west part of the sanctuary and work my way to the east part. What are your prayers of joy and concern today? Ray asks our prayers for his spouse, Bob's, uh, it's his brother, who has diabetes and is having a hard time controlling that and had to have toes amputated. So for his treatment and healing, the sense of strength and God's presence with him, we sing. Madeline asked our prayers of comfort for Robin Williams' family and for all those who live with mental illness, for comfort and for healing for them, and we sing. to ask our prayers for his uh, friend Mike and family whose twin brother died and they're having a memorial service today so for their comfort and strength the sense of God's presence with them we sing
Charlotte asks our prayers for her family, for her sister. Her, her brother was found dead yesterday. And so uh, as the whole family comes to terms with that and goes through this shock and loss, that they know God's presence and strength, and they can express that presence and strength through each other, through their hearts and through their hands, and know that our prayers are with them bringing him strength, and we sing. Hear our prayer, O God. Hear our prayer, O God. Patty asks our prayers for healing for Roger Tilton. He's, you know, he had surgery, and he's on his knees and his uh, knee, and he's had a lot of difficulty in healing. And uh, so he hasn't been here. You know, Roger and Gordy prepare coffee almost every Sunday. And so uh, for his healing and uh, ceasing of pain for him, and that he knows that we are with him, that we love him, care for him, and that God is with him, let us sing. Anne asks our prayers for her grandson and his family. They're moving from here locally to, to Idaho. Um, and so she wants the, their move to be safe and, and good and the transition wonderful for them. It's going to be difficult for her uh, to lose them, being so close. And so we're also praying for Anne that, um, that this tough time, she could be strengthened by by us and by God's love. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and we sing. Hear our prayer, O God. Hear our prayer, O God. Kathy asks our prayers for Kathy and Andrew's daughter, Christina, who's going to college uh, very soon, leaving the nest, going away, uh, for, for a blessing for her and this exciting new, new part of her journey. Uh, but also for Andrew and Kathy, as they have an empty nest, that uh, they make good use of it. <laughs> <laughs> And so we sing. <laughs> Rich says our prayers for, for Merlis and for all caregivers.